Hi, welcome to iEducator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today, we will discuss chapter three. And chapter three is all about anthropometry, workstation, and facility design. Now, there are nine key areas that I'm going to be highlighting right now. First, that would be the introduction. Second, designing for a population of users. Third, the sources of human variability. Fourth, anthropometry and its uses. Fifth, principles of applied anthropometry. Sixth, the applications of anthropometry in design. Seventh, design for everyone. Eighth, anthropometry and personal space. And finally, effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Today, we will discuss first the introductory part of our lesson for today. So what is meant by anthropometry then? If we say anthropometry, it comes from the Greek words anthropos, which means human, and metron, which means measure. Etymologically speaking, it means the measurement of human body. And in designing for population of users, it is of paramount importance for designers to determine the population and select representatives in that population. Now, here, Good ergonomic design makes provision for the range of variability to be expected in the user population. And aside from that, variation in user population can also affect design for safety. And therefore, ergonomic design is important for human use and safety based on population of user. Now, we need to always remember that anthropometric data are used in ergonomics to specify the physical dimensions of workspaces, equipment, furniture, and clothing to ensure that physical mismatches between the dimensions of equipment and products and the corresponding user dimensions are being avoided. And the first step in the designing for a population of user, that would be to specify the user population. And after specifying the user population, it is then time for us to design to accommodate as wide a range of users as possible, normally 90% of them. Remember, well designed products acknowledge and allow for the inherent variability of user population. So what is meant then by a population? Now in ergonomics, the word population is used in a statistical sense and can refer to a group of people sharing common ancestors, common occupations, common geographical locations, or age group. A user population may consist of people from different races or different ethnic groups, meaning different cultures, customs, language, and so on. And so for this matter, the step one in designing for a population of users means that for design purposes, the criteria for deciding what constitutes a population are functional and are related directly to the problem at hand. For example, if we want to design a cab for bus drivers in the United States, we require data on the anthropometry of American bus drivers, right? Another example, if we want to design workspaces in private hospitals in the Philippines, then we need data about the Filipino nurses who usually work in them, okay? So the sources of human variability, there are actually four types of adaptation under sources of human variability. And these are genetic, plasticity, acclimatization, and behavioral adaptation. Now, biological anthropologists distinguish four types of human adaptation. Over many lifetimes, genetic changes may occur 
as a result of natural selection. Over the course of a lifetime, organisms exhibit plasticity or literally the capability of being molded. Plasticity is an intermediate form of adaptation that takes place over the course of a lifetime. And according to Robert's 1995, he cited evidence that the heads of people who were habitually placed in a supine position in the first years of life grow to be broader than the heads of those who were more often placed on their sides. Over the short term, acclimatization can be exhibited by organisms. And take note, only the last two of these forms of adaptation are reversible. Now, there are also factors influencing the change in body size of our population. First, this is due to improved living conditions. And second, we have industrialization. Now, as you can notice, many studies indicate that better living conditions are associated with larger body size. Smallness does not appear to be intrinsic to many groups of people, but it is related to development in a biologically stressful environment. Thus, smallness in a population may be a plastic response to deprivation. Now, as you can see, the first factor influencing the change in body size of population is improved living conditions. There is a great deal to suggest that improved living conditions are accompanied by an increase in body size. Many countries have witnessed an increase in the size of their inhabitants over the last 150 years since the establishment of industrialized societies. Part of this is undoubtedly due to better diets and living conditions. Living conditions refer to better sanitation, childhood immunization, refrigerated transportation, making available a year-round supply of fresh food, and supplementation of daily dairy products and cereals with vitamin D. Now, according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the mean stature for U.S. males and females has not changed since the 1960s. So data from that era are still usable for ergonomics purposes. As you can see, the male stature is 175.25 centimeters, while the female stature is 162.65 centimeters. And the second factor influencing the change in body size of population is what we call industrialization. As countries industrialized over the last few hundred years, previously isolated rural communities were scattered owing to improvement in transportation and to urbanization. This resulted in an outbreeding or what we call heterosis, which is thought to be a result in a genetically healthier population with hybrid vigor. And the next key area that I'm going to be discussing today, that would be anthropometry and its uses in ergonomics. Now, as a rule of thumb, if we take the smallest or shortest female and the tallest male in the population, the male will be 30 to 40% taller, 100% heavier, and 500% stronger. This is according to Grieve and Fisant 1982. And clearly, the natural variation of human populations has implications for the way almost all products and devices are designed. Some obvious examples are clothes, furniture, and automobiles. Now, the approach of ergonomics is to consider product dimensions in human terms in view of the constraints placed on their design by body size variability. For example, a seat should be no higher than the pop little height of a short user and no deeper than the distance from the buttocks to the knees. 
And anthropometric information describes the dimensions of the human body, usually through the use of body landmarks, so which heights, breadths, depths, distances, circumference, and curvatures are being measured. Body size and proportion vary greatly between different population and racial groups. This is a fact which designers must never lose sight of when designing for international market. For example, a U.S. manufacturer hopes to export products to Mexico and Vietnam. And because of that, they would need to consider in what ways product dimensions optimized for a large U.S. user group would suit Mexican and Vietnamese users. If you may know, Vietnam belongs to one of the smallest populations in the world. Ashby 1979 illustrated the importance of anthropometry considerations in design as follows. Now, as you can see, if a piece of equipment was designed to fit 90% of the male U.S. population, it would fit roughly 90% of Germans, 80% of French, 65% of Italians, 35% of Japanese, 25% of Thais, and 10% of Vietnamese. It is also impractical and expensive to design products individually to suit the requirements of every user. Why is this so? This is because most products are mass produced and designed to fit a wide range of user. Now the bespoke tailor, the dressmaker, and the cobbler are perhaps the only remaining examples of truly user-oriented designers in Western industrialized societies. So there are two types, or there are three types rather, of anthropometric data which are used in ergonomics. And these are the structural data, the functional data, and the Newtonian data. Now, in order for us to better understand each of them, uh, let us discuss structural data first. If we say structural data, these are measurements of bodily dimensions of subjects in static postures. Now, these bodily measurements are made from clearly identifiable anatomical sites, usually bony landmarks under the skin. Now, some examples of the use of anthropometric data are first, to optimize furniture, second, clothing, and third, vehicle cab dimension. If we say to optimize furniture, what I mean about this is to specify furniture dimensions and ranges of adjustment. And for clothing, this is about determining ranges of clothing sizes, okay? So this is the whole picture of structural data. What about functional data? If we say functional data, these data are collected from subjects who are allowed to move one or more limbs in one or more place with respect to a fixed point. Now, examples for this one are data which are available concerning the maximum forward reach of standing subjects. In here, the area swept out by the movement of the hand can be used to describe workspace envelopes. And take note that workspace envelopes refer to zones of easy reach or maximum reach around an operator. Now, existing functional anthropometric data are useful for designing workspaces and positioning objects within them, particularly in the design of aircraft cockpits, crane cabs, and vehicle interiors and complex control panels in the process of industries. So this is all about the functional data. And finally, if we say Newtonian anthropometric data, these are used in mechanical analysis of the loads on the human body. Here, 
the body is being regarded as an assemblage of linked segments of known length and mass, sometimes expressed as a percentage of stature and body weight. Ranges of the appropriate angles to be subtended by adjacent links are also given to enable suitable ranges of working postures to be defined. Now, this enables designers to specify these regions of the workspace in which displays and controls may be most optimally positioned. And the next key area that I'm going to be discussing today, that would be the principles of applied anthropometry in ergonomics. Now, anthropometric variables in the healthy population usually follow a normal distribution. Now, as you can see on the presentation, this is the normal distribution. 90% of the measurements made on different people will fall in a range whose width is negative 1.64 standard deviations above and below the average. Now, for design purposes, there are two key parameters of normal distribution. First, we have the mean, and second, we have the standard deviation. If we say mean, this is the sum of all the individual measurements divided by the number of measurements. And remember, in your statistics subject, mean is one of the measures of central tendency. On the other hand, if we see standard deviation, it is calculated using the difference between each individual measurement and the mean. If the mean is a measure of central tendency, then your standard deviation is a measure of the degree of dispersion in the normal distribution. And therefore, the value of the mean determines the position of our normal distribution along our x-axis or the horizontal axis. On the other hand, the value of the standard deviation determines the shape of the normal distribution. So what if the value of standard deviation is small and large. What does it mean? Well, a small value of the standard deviation indicates that most of the measurements are close to the mean value. And therefore, the distribution has a high peak that fails off rapidly at both sides. On the other hand, a large value of the standard deviation means that the measurements are scattered more distantly from the mean, and therefore, the distribution has a flatter shape. Now, in order to estimate the parameter of stature in a population, it is necessary to measure a large sample of people who are representative of that population. Now, as you can see on the presentation, the formula presented can then be used to calculate the estimates of the mean and your standard deviation. Estimates of the population parameters obtained from calculations on data from samples are known as sample statistics. So how do we estimate our range then? Now, in estimating our range, the standard deviation contains information about the spread of scores in a sample. For a normal distribution, it is also known that approximately two-thirds of the observations in the population fall within one standard deviation above and below them. Therefore, for a population with a mean stature of 1.75 meters and standard deviation of 0.10 meters, approximately two-thirds of the population would be between 1.65 and 1.85 meters tall. The remaining one third would lie beyond these two extremes at either side. Using the standard deviation and the mean, estimates of stature can be calculated below which a specified percentage of the population will fall. Now the area under the normal curve at any point along the x-axis can be expressed in terms of the number of standard deviation from the mean. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let's have an example. So, for example, if the standard deviation is multiplied by the constant 
1.64 and subtracted from the mean and the height below which 5% of the population falls is obtained. If 1.64 standard deviations are added to the mean, the height below which 95% of the population falls is obtained. Now, these are known as the 5th and the 95th percentile heights. The 1st and the 99th percentile heights are obtained when the constant 2.32 is used. So how about if we apply statistics to our design? Now, statistics information about body size is not enough in itself directly applicable to a design problem. First, the designer has to analyze in what ways, if any, anthropometric mismatches might occur and then decide which anthropometric data must be appropriate to the problem. And next, a suitable percentile has to be chosen. Now let us discard, uh, discuss first uh, the first bullet. So the designer has to analyze in what ways, if any, anthropometric mismatches might occur and then decide which anthropometric data might be appropriate to the problem. Now, in other words, the designer has to develop some clear ideas about what constitutes an appropriate match between users and product dimensions. And next, a suitable percentile has to be chosen. What do we mean by this? Here, in many design applications, mismatches occur only at one extreme. When I say extreme, I'm referring to very tall and very short people because these people are the ones who are usually affected. So how do we solve this problem then? Now, in order to solve this problem, we need to select either a maximum or a minimum dimension. If the design accommodates people at the appropriate extreme of the anthropometric range, the less extreme people will be accommodated. And aside from applying statistics to design, we also need to understand about applying minimum dimensions. Now, if we say minimum dimensions, here, a high percentage value of an appropriate anthropometric dimension is being chosen. For example, when designing a doorway, sufficient headroom for very tall people has to be provided and 95th and 99th percentile male stature could be used to specify a minimum height. Second, seat breadth is also determined using a minimum dimension. The width of a seat, or the width of the seat rather, must be no narrower than the largest hip width in the target population. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let me show you uh, an example figure of seat breadth should be determined using minimum dimension. So as you can notice, the width of the seat must be no narrower than the largest hip width in the target population. That, so that should be how it looks like. And third, minimum dimensions are used to specify the placement of controls on machines, door handles, etc. Now, for example, controls must be high off the ground that tall operators can reach them without stooping. Now, in the case of the door handles, the maximum vertical reach of a small child might also be considered to prevent young children opening doors when unsupervised. And finally, um, by application of minimum dimensions, we also need to have applications of maximum dimensions. Now, in maximum dimensions, a low percentile is chosen in determining the height of a door latch so that the smallest adult in a population will be able to reach it. Now, this means that the latch must be no higher than the maximum vertical grip of a small person. And second, the height of non-adjustable seats used in public transport systems and the auditoria is also determined using this principle. The seat must be low enough 
so that a short person can rest the feet on the floor when using it. Therefore, the seat height must be no higher than the first percentile or fifth percentile top little height in the population. Now, in order for us to better understand this, this is um, an example of functional anthropometric data. And the figure shows the shapes of the rich envelopes and the allowable and preferred zones for the placement of controls in a workspace. And next key area that I'm going to be highlighting right now, that would be the applications of anthropometry in design. So in here, we're going to be um, making sure that we will be able to acknowledge the different or the common anthropometric variables and how they are being used in ergonomics. So examples of some common anthropometric variables and how they are used in ergonomics, uh, we have 16. First, we have standing eye height. Second, we have standing shoulder height. Third, we have standing elbow height. Next, we have standing knuckle height. Fifth, we have standing fingertip height. Sixth, we have sitting height. Seventh, we have sitting elbow height. Eighth, we have pop little height. Ninth, we have knee height and thigh depth. Tenth, we have bottom pop little length. Eleventh, we have shoulder width. Twelfth, we have hip breadth. Thirteenth, we have abdominal or chest depth. Fourteenth, we have vertical reach, both sitting and standing. 15th, we have rib circumference, and finally, we have reach. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these anthropometric variables and how they are used in ergonomics, then we will be discussing each of them one by one, starting with standing eye height. Now, as you can see, this is the height above the ground of the eye of a person standing erect. So as you can see on the example, so there, that is an example of your standing eye height. Again, this is the height above the ground of the eye of a person standing erect. So how is it used in ergonomics? It can be used in ergonomics as a maximum allowable dimension to locate visual displays for standing operators. Now, the displays should not be higher than the standing eye height of a short operator because short operators not need to extend their neck to look at this place. Again, this is our standing eye height anthropometric variable. The next anthropometric variable that we have, that would be standing shoulder height. If we say standing shoulder height, this is the height of the acromion above the ground. Now, as you can see, so highlighted there in red and in black, that is where your standing shoulder height is located. Again, this is the height of the acromion above the ground. And how is it applied in ergonomics? It is used in ergonomics to estimate the height of the center of rotation of the arm above the ground and can help specify the maximum allowable height for a control. A short worker should not need to elevate the arms above shoulder height to operate a control. So that is its use in ergonomics. And the next um, anthropometric variable that we have, that would be standing elbow height. Now, if this is standing elbow height, it refers to the height above the ground of the elbows of a person standing erect. Now, as you can see on the sample image, highlighted or encircled in yellow, that is, what, that is where your standing elbow height is located. And how is it used in ergonomics? It is used to design the maximum allowable bench height for standing workers. For delicate tasks, bench heights can be slightly higher than elbow height so that the workers can stabilize the forearm by restricting them on the bench. And another anthropometric variable, we have standing knuckle height. Now, if this is standing knuckle height, this is the height of the knuckle above the ground. Now, as you can see on the first picture and the second picture as well, so that is where your knuckle height is being located. And how is it applied in ergonomics? 
It is used in ergonomics to determine the minimum height of full grip for a standing operator. Operators with high standing knuckle heights should not have to stoop when grasping objects in the workplace. And next we have standing fingertip height. Now this is the height of the tips of our fingers above the ground, as you can see on the sample images. And how is it used in ergonomics? This is used to determine the lowest allowable position for controls, such as switches. Okay, next we have sitting height. Now, if we say sitting height, this is the distance from the seat to the crown of the head. Now, as you can see on the first and second image, so that is where your sitting height is being located, the distance from the seat to the crown of your head. So it is applied in ergonomics to determine ceiling heights, especially in vehicles, to provide enough clearance for users with large sitting height. And aside from this, the next anthropometric variable I use in ergonomics that would be sitting elbow height. Now this is the height of the elbow of a seated person above the chair. Now as you can see on the sample image, encircled your uh, encircled with yellow, that is where your sitting elbow height is being located. And its application in ergonomics is to determine armrest heights and work surface heights for seated operators. And next we have popliteal height. This is the height of the popliteal fossa. When we say popliteal fossa, this is the back of our knee, as you can see on the picture. This is, this is the back of the knee above the ground. Now, the fifth percentile popliteal height may be used to determine the maximum allowable height of non-adjustable seats. On the other hand, the 95th percentile popliteal height may be used to determine or to set the highest level of adjustment of height adjustable seats. And next, we have knee height and thigh depth. Now, taken together, these variables specify the height above the floor of the upper thigh of a seated person, just like as you can see on the sample image. And it is used in ergonomics to determine the thigh clearance required under a table or even a console. Next, we have buttock popliteal height. Now, for buttock popliteal height, this is the distance from the buttocks to the back of the knee. Now, how is it applied in ergonomics? This is used in ergonomics to determine the maximum allowable seat depth such that seat depth does not exceed the buttock popliteal length of short operators. Now, as you can see on the sample image, so that is where your popliteal height is being located. Another, we have shoulder height. Now, for shoulder height, it refers to the widest distance across your shoulder, as you can see on the sample pictures. Its application in ergonomics is to determine the minimum width of narrow doorways, corridors, etc. to provide clearance for those with wide shoulders. And another we have hip breadth. And if we say hip breadth, this is the widest distance across the hips, as you can see on the sample image. And in ergonomics, this is used to determine the space requirements necessary for clearance and, for example, the minimum width of seats to allow clearance for those, for those with wide hips. And next, we have abdominal or chest depth. Now, it refers to the widest distance from a wall behind the person to the chest or abdomen in front, just like as you can see on the sample image. And it is used to determine the minimum clearance required in a confined space. Next, we have vertical reach, both sitting and standing. For vertical reach, it refers to the highest vertical reach, meaning it is applied in ergonomics by determining maximum allowable height for overhead controls, door latches, etc., such that they are reachable by the shortest user. 
And next, we have grip circumference. As you can see on the sample images, this refers to the internal circumference of the grip from the root of the fingers across the tip and to the palm when grasping an object. And it is used to specify the maximum circumference of tool handles and other objects to be held in the palm of our hands. Handle circumferences should enable those with small hands to grasp the tool with slight overlap of the thumb and fingers. And finally, we have reach. This is the dimension of the reach envelope around an operator can be used to locate controls so that seated operators can operate them without having to lean forward away from the backrest or twist the trunk and standing operators can operate them without the normal work area to eliminate reach over 40 centimeters for repeated actions. All right, so these are some of the many anthropometric variables and its uses in ergonomics. And the next key area that I'm going to be discussing right now, that would be the design for everyone. Now, we know for a fact that matching product and user dimensions is of paramount importance for reasons of safety, health, and usability. And because of this, the problem of designing to suit a range of users can be approached in several different ways. So it can be approached either to make different sizes, to design adjustable products, and to fit for use surveys. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these approaches, then let us discuss first the first approach, which is making different sizes. Now, this is one approach to problem of designing to suit a range of user. Now, in making different sizes here, including a school furniture design, a common solution is to design the same product in several different sizes. Now, why is that? It is because of the fact that anthropometric data can be used to determine a minimum number of different sizes that will accommodate all users. We know for a fact as well that mass production and long production runs often bring economies of scale in product design through reduced retooling and stoppages. This usually has economic benefits and demonstrates why it is important to determine the minimum number of sizes in a product range that will accommodate most of the users in the population in question. And second, clothing design is the best example of fitting the product to the user. There are actually standards such as ISO 3636 for the designation of clothing sizes. And because of this standard, it is left to the manufacturer to decide what sizes to make. And this is often done uh, through trial and error, or also known as knowing the market, rather than by carrying out an anthropometric survey. Now, the dimensions that are usually used to designate the size of a piece of clothing, that would be head girth, neck girth, chest girth, bust girth, under bust girth, waist girth, hip girth, stature, and outside and inside leg length. The second approach to problem of designing to suit a range of user, uh, that would be designing adjustable products. Now first, an alternative is to manufacture products whose critical dimensions can be adjusted by the users themselves. Now in order to do this, the first step that we need to do is to determine what the critical dimensions for use are. Second, to design the mechanism of adjustability with the emphasis on ease of operation. And finally, some instructions or a training program may be needed to explain to users the importance of adjusting the product and how to adjust it correctly. Now, for example, in seated work, the height of the seat and desk are critical dimensions for seated comfort. Again, 
the height of the seat and desk are critical dimensions for seated comfort. Now, the seat height should be no higher than the top little height of the user so that both feet can be rested firmly on the floor to support the weight of the lower legs. Otherwise, the soft tissues on the underside of the thigh take the weight and blood circulation is impeded owing to the compression of these tissues. Now, secondly, the desk height should coincide with the user's sitting elbow height. Again, again, the desk height should coincide with the user's sitting elbow height. Since pop little height and elbow height do not correlate strongly in practice, according to Verbit 1991, then adjustable seat and desk heights are needed. And next, one problem with adjustability is that users may not use adjustment facility if they do not expect a product to be adjustable or if they do not understand the reason for incorporating adjustability into the product. Now, what do we mean by this? Now, Verbeek 1991 investigated the effect of an instruction program for office workers on the anthropometric fit between users and their chair or desk workstation. Now, before the program, a survey of chair desk setting in an office revealed mean deviations from the ideal of 71 millimeters for a seat height and 70 millimeters for desk height. Now, a model of correct sitting was used as a criterion to evaluate the chair or desk settings. After the program, these deviations were reduced by 11 millimeters and 18 millimeters respectively. However, only 7% of the users adjusted their seat heights as advised, and only 30% adjusted their desk heights as advised. It was concluded that this meager result was due to practical difficulties. An aesthetic appearance of adjacent desks having different heights and the suspect validity of the model of correct setting that have been used to specify the method of adjustment. And finally, the last approach that is used uh, based on the problem of designing to suit a range of user that would be fit for use survey. Now, there are many ways of assessing how well a work environment fits its user. First, we can measure the critical features of equipment and compare them with user anthropometry. We may unobtrusively observe people at work and note any apparent problems. And second, we may carry out some kind of task analysis and consult the users, asking them to report any problems experienced. Now, a minimal set of items for a questionnaire designed to assess fit is given on the following tabulation. So this tabulation is your questionnaire items for a basic survey of anthropometric fit. Now, if you want to know if there is a mismatch between the user and your desk, Okay, so this, these are the following information that you can include in your survey. So under personal characteristics, you have their age, gender, height, weight, chest circumference, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can follow this format, especially if you are having a research study about fitting, about anthropometric fit. And the next key area that I'm going to be discussing today, that would be anthropometry and personal space. What do I mean by personal space? If we say personal space, it can be defined as the area immediately around the body. Now, Argyle 1975 describes personal space in the context of territorial behavior. Now, as you can notice, Many animals regard a certain area of space as their exclusive preserve. And the area immediately around an individual's body is usually regarded as two important issues in psychoanthropometry are the volume of space, which is regarded as personal territory, and secondly is the consequences 
of an invasion of this space by others. And second, large individuals and cultural differences exist. Now, what do we mean by this? Arda reports the results of studies that indicate that Arabs stand closer together than Europeans and North Americans with Latin Americans and Asian intermediate. And finally, invasion of personal space and crowded conditions appear to be stressful. This is according to Dabs, 1971. Now, in an experiment that is now infamous, Middle Mist et al, 1976, tested the hypothesis that personal space invasion increases arousal. On their study, they actually measured the time to onset and duration of maturation. Maturation meaning urination of 60 men using a public laboratory, each under one of the three conditions. We have the subject alone, which refers to our control condition. Second, subject standing next to a confederate, which refers to our adjacent invasion. And lastly, we have subject one urinal removed from the confederate, which refers to our moderate invasion. Now, the confederate was an accomplice of the experimenters and arrived after the subject had unwittingly taken his place. Now, as a result, onset time of maturation increased from 4.9 seconds in the control condition to 6 to 6.2 seconds in the moderate space invasion and 8.4 seconds for adjacent invasion. Maturation duration dropped from 24.8 seconds in the control condition to 23.4 and 17.4 seconds in the space invasion conditions respectively. Now, in the context of public laboratory use, the minimum required personal space would appear to be about the distance of one urinal, okay? And finally, the last key area that I'm gonna be discussing today, that would be effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Now, as you can see, there are four important areas that we will be giving emphasis in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. First, we have the benefits of protective clothing that fits. Second, industrial workplace layout. Third, adjustability and adjustment of office furniture. And finally, effectiveness of office ergonomics intervention. Now, first we have benefits of protective clothing that fits. Now, many companies, as you can notice, spend a lot of money on protective clothing and equipment for their employees. Ensuring correct fit is one of the basic requirements for the item to function correctly. Now, if we say protective clothing, we mean protective personal equipment or PPE. Now, based on the definition, Warktosh 1994 carried out an investigation of lead protectors used by forestry workers in South Africa a group of considerable ethnic diversity. Now, the existing lead protectors were imported from Brazil and had not succeeded any preventing injury because five injuries were occurring per day among the 300 workers. So, in order to solve the problem, the protectors were modified to suit the anthropometry of the users and together with the improvements to the materials and fastenings. The result was complete prevention of leg injuries due to access and hatches in the one year follow-up period. Now the cost saving was approximately $250,000 and was expected to provide even greater savings when implemented on a larger scale. And next, we have industrial workplace layout. Now, Lim and Huffman, 1997, investigated the performance of elite assembly tasks when components were laid out within the zone of convenience reach, or the ZCR. 
ZZR is defined as the area of the table within the arc swept by the hand with the elbow extended. Within this zone is the so-called normal working area, which is defined by a similar sweep of each hand, but with 90 degrees of elbow flexion. Now, based on Lame and Huffman's investigation, an approximately 10% improvement in assembly time was achieved when items were placed within the zone of convenient reach and arranged in an ergonomically designed jig. And these improvements led to more efficient hand movements, reducing lengthy reaches and control and control lateral movements and increasing the number of simultaneous hand actions. And finally, we have adjustability and adjustment of office furniture. Now, a number of studies have been carried out already into productivity in office environments, even up until today. Now, some took place in the early 1980s when desktop computers were first being introduced into offices, often without any modification to the rest of the workplace. And according to adjustability and adjustment of office furniture, as you can notice, modern office work is heavily computerized and requires the adaptation of static postures for long periods as people have less reasons to leave their desks, just uh, as you can see on the sample pictures presented. And it would be expected as well that a good fit between workers and their equipment is one of the requirements for the improved productivity. Now, according to RAF 1985, in 1981, the Merck company decided to upgrade its office facilities in an attempt to create a more productive and more healthy environment. 200 office workers were sent a questionnaire and asked to rate 29 features of workstations regarding job effectiveness and satisfaction. And based on the findings of the study, the greatest mismatches between workstations and satisfaction were in air conditioning, the ability to concentrate and privacy, overall workspace size, and work area. Now, in order to remedy such problem, training videos on how to use and adjust the new workstations were also produced. And therefore, the return on all renovation projects was 25%. And for one, an installation for 74 international workers, the return was 50% with an improvement in turnaround of jobs from four days to six hours. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. If you have questions, please let me know on the comment section below. And if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.